So about 2006, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Nevada, lived in Reno, Nevada, and had a uh, had an assault case uh, arose on tribal lands. And my witness, who I believe she was Paiute, I said, Miss Jones, did you and your husband have a fight? No. Continue on with the rest of the, you know, there was no fights that night, none whatsoever. Move on with the rest of the direct examination, have a seat. The defense attorney stands up, first question he asks, Mrs. Jones, now I'm using a different name, Mrs. Jones, isn't it true that same night you stabbed your husband? Well, yes, I did. I'm sitting there baffled. And we take a break, and, and I visit with her. Well, actually, I had to have stand on cross-examination for, uh, for, for redirect. Mrs. Jones, do you remember one of my very first questions was, did you and your husband have a fight that night? Yes. And what was your answer? The answer was no. I'm sorry, Ms. Jones, you just told the defense counsel that you stabbed him that night. Oh, that's true, but there was no fight. The lesson is, pay attention to your questions, because in her mind, there was no fight. And yes, she did stab him. Of course, you know, that's the most important thing in dealing with this is communication. The kind of, some of the things I want to talk about is understanding cultural differences with witnesses, jurors, whether it's in tribal court, state court, or federal court, you need to have cultural awareness. And this, this doesn't apply to Native Americans. However, it is greatly overlooked. If you're trying a case in Tulsa County, selecting a jury, or uh, you have a witness, you pay attention to who your jurors are, who your witnesses are, and you know whether it's Oklahoma County, if it's in federal court, the Western District, or the Eastern District, or the Northern District of Oklahoma, or you're doing a federal appeal, uh, all the way to the 10th Circuit, you have to remember who your audience is. Now, the same lessons that I'm, I'm going to be talking about today as applied to witnesses and jurors, you apply as well to your judge. Know your judge. Know who they are. Know where they come from. Understand their education. Understand the things that they like. More importantly, understand the things that they don't like. But we're going to focus on the witnesses and jurors today. There is a difference with Native American witnesses and jurors. You have to take this into consideration. Now, some of these rules, as I stated, they apply across the board. Whether this person lives, if they're from New York, if they're from LA, if they are Jewish, if they're if they if they <coughs> must, you have, if they grew they grew up in a rural small area in Oklahoma, if they are from that foreign country we like to call Texas. You have to understand these background with these individuals. You have to understand how they talk. If they have a military background, are they a member of the Masonic Lodge? Do they do, do, do they have kids? Do they not have kids? But when it comes to Native American, it's even more unique. And as every, everybody in this room knows, you know, one size does not fit all. Now, this this presentation I've generalized. You know, with over 500 tribes in the United States. If you have 12 people on a jury, and all 12 came from 12 different tribes, can you apply the same to each of those to each of those members just because they are all Native American? No. As you know, each and every tribe has its own culture, its own history, its own language, its own traditions. Their own, you know, while there are some shared culture, it does change. Now, real quick, uh, jury trials are disappearing. We have now moved into a situation where uh, most disputes, if there's a contract for us, requires mediation or arbitration. Most large law firms that you see, whether, you know, as I, as I like to refer to them, the big tower lawyers, the big, those big tower lawyers have lots of litigators, but, but just because they're a litigator does not mean that they're a trial lawyer. Litigation is not necessarily the same as trial work, I'm, and I know a lot of litigators who have been litigators for their entire lives but have not ever had an opportunity to try a case. Sometimes they never have the opportunity. Sometimes they fall into the habit of doing anything they can to settle the case rather than trying it. 
Thanks, law professor and criminal defense attorney Michael Tiger. Um, he was one of the defense counsel in the Oklahoma City bombing case. He was one. He's been a law professor at the University of Texas for a long time, and I'm not sure where he's teaching at right now. But he's a well-known litigator, and a lot of law firms, the big tower lawyers, well, they, he gets brought in every now and then. And he was brought into a case in Houston, Texas. And they said, Mr. Tiger, we have had this case going on in litigation for almost 10 years. We have done everything we can. We have done discovery. We have done depositions. We cannot get this case resolved. We, Mr. Tiger, we would like to bring you in as one of the most experienced trial lawyers in this country to help resolve this case. And after Mr. Tiger spent a couple days reviewing through all, through all the information, through all through the lawsuit, reviewing through the depositions, he goes into the boardroom filled with lawyers, lawyers at $300, $400 an hour. And this was his answer. Have you thought about trying the case? There are very few, uh, while filings in the United States, both in criminal courts and in civil cases, have more than doubled, quadrupled, five times as they were in the 1960s, we try less cases now than we did in 1962. Part of the reason is, part, part of the reason is one, mediation uh, and arbitration in civil cases. And on the criminal side, I think we've become lawyers who look for maybe the path of least resistance, are afraid of the judge. Judges don't mind a jury trial. In fact, um, roughly a decade ago, I, I was appointed as a special judge for the call nation. I was brought in to do one thing, to hear a trial. The, uh, the leadership, uh, certain members of the leadership had gotten involved with uh, a lawsuit in tribal court. And the, at the time, the Chief Justice of the Call Nation Supreme Court asked me if I could come in and handle a trial. I said, absolutely. And I was surprised when I got there that there was almost so, so many resistance and they want to have more, more motion work, more arguments. And I'm like, let's have a trial. Let's pick our jury and let's go forward. And we did. We had, we had, we had our trial. The case resolved. And even though there was a loser, and there is obviously a winner, both sides were happy with the result. And for the last 10 years, I remained at the call nation uh, hearing, hearing their cases. Don't be afraid to take the case to trial. A judge is not going to punish you for it if you are the litigant, whether you are civil matter or a criminal matter. As a prosecutor, a plaintiff's attorney, or a defense counsel, whether in a criminal or civil matter, don't be afraid. Now, one of the things uh, in, in trying these cases there's less opportunities. So if you have an opportunity to second chair a case, second chair the case. Third chair the case. Get involved with it. Now, getting back to understanding your witnesses and jurors, a lot of people think because the world is now smaller. If you've, uh, if you've ever heard of this book, The World is Flat, um, it's actually an older book, and it's probably even more applicable now, that it talks about how, how so many of our culture worldwide has now become intertwined thanks to the internet, the World Wide Web, television. We're watching the same shows on Netflix. We're watching, we have the same interests on the cable, the shows we watch on television. We visit the same websites, generally. But uh, it talks about how the world is flat. You know, when they opened up, uh, well, in fact, uh, Thomas Friedman had pointed out that uh, once, once a McDonald's had opened up in a country, uh, no, no two countries that had McDonald's ever went to war. And I think that was true until, I think, the last couple of years. I think there was one country that actually had a McDonald's restaurant that actually ended up in a war. But generally, it's talking about how the world is shrinking. Now, internet, social media, talk about Facebook, Instagram, cable television, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, YouTube, we're all watching the same stuff. Now, let me, let me do a little bit of an aside. As a trial lawyer, I know lots of lawyers who say, I can't stand to read lawyer books, I can't stand to watch lawyer television shows or cop shows because it really bothers me because they're not doing it right, they don't really don't portray it 100% accurately, this really bothers me. Mistake. Big mistake. You know why? Because that's what your jurors watch. That's what your witnesses watch. If you want to communicate with your witness, if you want to get out good information, if you want to accomplish a, a solid cross-examination, if you want to communicate to your jurors, 
you need to be watching those shows that they watch on Netflix, Hulu, uh, YouTube. If you're not aware that the younger generation, everything they watch now is on YouTube. You know, my 12-year-old daughter and all her friends, they don't watch anything on Netflix. Everything is now on YouTube. YouTube shows, YouTube stars, we're now moving into a whole new era. You need to pay attention to what people are watching. What's the most popular criminal shows, trial shows, lawyer shows on Netflix, on ABC, NBC, CBS, HBO, whatever? You need to be watching because that's what your jurors are watching. If, you can, if, if you're not watching what they're watching, they're expecting you to look, act, and talk exactly like the lawyers do on, on those television shows. Now, obviously, some of them, obviously you don't want to do that because your judge won't appreciate it. It might toss you out on your ear, but you need to be able to look the part, talk the part that they expect you to, expect you to because that's what they've seen on television. Now, obviously, we don't want to go in there and talk like my cousin Vinny or, uh, or, or, or some of those other, but there's some great lessons there. Okay. Getting to know your witnesses and your jerk and what you expect out of your jurors. If you're a lawyer, you don't practice regularly in the second box court or in the federal court in the Eastern District of Oklahoma, or uh, if you haven't been down to Comanche County to try a case in the Comanche County District Court, the state court there, you know, where do you, who, who are your jurors? Who are your people? You know, if your witnesses are down there, have you really spent any time with them? You know, if you notice your witness uses a particular word or phrase, you might realize, hey, it's, it's very, it might become local. I mean, here's a big local word. Hey, you say COVID or you say pop. But who, who says COVID? Anybody? There's a couple. Who, who, who calls it soda? And who just calls it pop? See? It's... As you see, I can, you can almost point out, okay, you know, you folks over here, the, the last one, you're definitely Eastern Oklahoma, soda, well, you're probably Wisconsin, or <laughs> some, 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 somewhere in the Northeast, uh, you know, if you, uh, or it's Coke, you know, it's, it, it's, very, it's very localized or generalized. Same with the tribes. you gotta, you got to talk your talk. Um, I began my career as a lawyer, uh, you know, officially, as an Army judge advocate. I was, I was an active duty Army lawyer, tried cases, all over, you know, a lot of different places, whether it's in Bosnia or whether it's Fort Knox or Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And even within the military, it depended on you had to know your audience. There's a big difference whether you were in the infantry or you rode in a tank. You know, they use their own different words. If you jumped out of airplanes, each of them had their own culture. They used different words. And as a lawyer, when you're talking to a jury, talking to your witness, or talking, uh, giving a presentation, your closing arguments, you want to sprinkle those words into your into, into your statements. I did a federal trial a couple of years ago, in which one of my juror members, I figured out he had served on active duty with the seventh the seventh infantry division. Now they're out of Fort Stewart, Georgia. A very proud history, and during World War II, uh, their, their their big phrase is whenever they would salute, they would always say "Rock and arm." In, in reference to a battle that was at the, basically in Marne, in, 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 uh, in France. Well, of course, in my closing argument, speaking for 30 minutes, I made sure when, they, when somebody was trying to tear apart some of my witnesses, I simplified it and said, look, it's very simple. They, and I made sure to mention, they're not the 7th Infantry Division marching through Iraq, at, you know, screaming the Rock of the Marne. That one witness looked at me and nodded his head. I knew I had him. You know, I noticed another witness had a had a Masonic pen. You know, you got you got to know your witnesses. You drop a phrase, all of a sudden they, not, they all of a sudden you see they that you acknowledge them. No one else realizes it. Judges don't know it. Opposing counsel doesn't know it. Same thing happens. Do you think the culture and the history and the traditions are the same for the Creek Nation as they are for the Comanche, for the Sac and Fox, for the Call, the Iowa, the Miami? You know, thirty-nine tribes. Each have their own individual histories, cultures, traditions, language. Now, one of the things I've noticed, and this is, this is very generalized, communication. And, it's, and again, I'm, I'm being very generic here because if you want to know 
your audience, your witness. You have to spend time with them. You have to see where they live. You have to visit. You have to read their newspapers. See what the issues are that's most affecting them. Is it water? Is it poverty? Is it employment? Is it issues within their own tribal government? How can this help your case? How can this hurt your case if you use the wrong phrase? What if you say something that offends somebody you had no idea what you just said? And this PowerPoint is also available to you guys. It should be uploaded on the, on the site as well. One of the things that um, for people who do, you know, who do not work with the tribes, who don't do business with the tribes, who do not practice in tribal courts, who, or who deal with uh, uh, Native Americans at all, you know, they have to understand there is a difference. Personal space is difference. Eye contact is difference. You know, how meetings are conducted and run, you know, they, you know, what, you know what's, what's probably known as Indian time. You know, I remember uh, my, my very first job, I worked as a, as a legal, legal clerk for the Cherokee Nation a very long, a very long time ago. My supervisor was, uh, well, became chief, chief of Cherokee Nation. Uh, Chad Smith was my supervisor. Chief Mankiller was my boss. And I remember he showed up at 8 a.m. bright and early at the Cherokee Nation courthouse, and nobody was there. And I sat there and sat there, and all of a sudden came in, and we got there, we got to work, we got a lot of things done. But I understood that things were, there was a, there was a practice. It was the way they did things. We didn't start at 8 a.m. We, we, they would come in at 8.15 or 8.30 or 9, one at a time, two at a time. But as they came in, it's sort of like getting, you know, getting the engine revved up. And once we were running, we, we were off to the races. But that was a very cultural thing. And maybe, it, you know, it might be very generic, very you know, stereotypical, but I've heard it used over and over, over again in regards to talk about the Indian time. But again, you have to know the culture of that tribe. And these are very generic, and these are not applicable to, uh, to, to all. But I'm putting these out there as things you have to consider when you're talking to a witness. You know, and d depending on the type of case, it might help you understand as to why a witness <coughs> reacted a certain way, or why a witness will respond a certain way when it comes to the type of question that you ask. If you're talking about a dead relative, or if you're talking about a dead body, an accident, a car wreck, if you're talking about a contract, if you're talking about a relationship dealing with elders, why is that important to this witness? And why don't you understand? Okay, questions. Uh, take it literal. Okay, this goes back to my, my introductory question when I was talking about Mrs. Jones. You know, there wasn't a fight, but yes, she's stabbing, but there wasn't any fight. Watch your questions. Pay attention. One of the ways that I would always uh, get witnesses ready, and I would always tell, I'd always explain to a witness, listen, and, and listen to my question and only answer my question. And I'm sure every lawyer has said that to a witness. And every witness goes, yeah, 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 of course. I want to answer the question. I'm not going to say anything more. No, you don't understand. But let me put it to you this way. Um, do you have a watch? Yeah, it's 2 o'clock. That was my question. And all of a sudden they realize. Ah, yes, I have watched. So you have to work with your witnesses so that they understand you. I went through a training several years ago uh, with, uh, with an expert in picking juries and in trying cases. His name is Joshua Carton. He's, uh, he's actually a non-lawyer. He's actually a professional actor who's been working with, with lawyers for the last 40 years. And he's probably a better trial lawyer than, as a non-lawyer than anyone else I've, I've met. One of the things that he had, he had talked about was uh, one of the biggest cases that he'd ever worked with, and I think it was a case he worked with, Jerry Spence, a well-known author, trial lawyer in Wyoming, wore the fringe on the coat. He talked about that Jerry Spence would take the time to go to, their, go, go to the witness's house to talk about the case. He would ask if he could have dinner with them, and he would show up early, and he would offer to make dinner with them. And while he's doing dinner, he says some of the best information he learned about a case came from a witness while they made a salad together. You know, it made me laugh, but it was a really good point. You really have to get in. You have to get your boots on the ground. You have to get out there. If your witnesses or your jury members, if they live at White Eagle and you've never been to White Eagle, you need to go to White Eagle. If they, if, if they went to Riverside School and you've never been to the Riverside School, you need to go. 
because you're going to be missing something. One of the things that I, I have learned in 24 years of doing this is, is these little details. They have nothing to do with the case, but can make all the difference. For example, I had a police officer on the stand, normal jury, but I wanted this jury to appreciate and understand what this police officer had to do on a daily basis in the jurisdiction that he worked. So I asked him to bring up some odd fact. And I asked him out of curiosity, and I'm like, I'm going to bring this up in front of the jury. Had absolutely nothing to do with the case. But I asked the question for one reason and one reason only. I wanted the jury to respect him, to give him some credibility. Here was my question. Officer, you know, Officer Smith, I have a question. You know, I, I've noticed that I've seen someone, someone get pulled over and a police car will pull up right behind them and they'll pull over. The police car will kind of go off in a ditch and kind of angle back up. I said, why do they do that? And I've always been, has anyone ever noticed that? You know why they do that? When they, if, if the guy, if, if the person in the car that gets pulled over, if they come out shooting, a bullet is going to go through that door, go through that window right away. A bullet will be stopped by the engine block. That's why police officers do that. I brought that little tidbit up in, the, in, in a trial. It had nothing to do with the case. It was just an interesting little fact. The judge didn't, the judge and opposing counsel didn't even notice, you know, notice the question. They just thought it was like, a, you know, out of curiosity. No, it was, it was purposeful. And the jurors appreciated it. They said, wait a second. This guy, every time he pulls over a car, he's not really sure what's going to happen when the other person, if the other person gets out. That's why they do that. So, again, get to know your witnesses. Get to know where they live and what their lives are like and what's affecting them. Uh, social rules. Again, all very generic, stereotypical, but I think it's a good start. So, you know, if you uh, take a look at this later, you print it off or uh, you want to read it. Again, just some things to put in the back of your head. Very important if you're dealing with somebody, whether they're Comanche or Cheyenne Arapaho, or if you if you if you try a case or you're in a courtroom in another tribal court out west, whether it's Navajo or you go up to uh, South Dakota to Pine Ridge, it is all very different. All very different. One thing I I can say that's consistent with all uh, Native, uh, with all Native American tribes, the elders are are uh, honored and respected. I sit as a tribal court judge for the cause of Iowa's and the Miami. I'm also uh, a justice on the court, and I served briefly with just, uh, Judge Bigler for the Comanche. And one thing that it didn't matter what role I had, when an elder came into the courtroom, if the elder was to speak, the judge, the attorneys, made sure to, to give them the respect that they deserved. And especially if you're doing this in front of a jury, whether it's a tribal jury, or you're trying a case in state court in Tulsa County, Creek County, wherever in Oklahoma County, and you have tribal members sitting on, on that jury, and you you likely will, if you don't acknowledge that respect of that elder, you could lose that you could lose your jury. If your witness is a tribal elder, and you don't at least give or acknowledge it to a certain respect, and this is one of your important witnesses, you might be losing. Your case because your witness will notice your lack of acknowledgement and lack of respect. So if you do have a tribal elder, and it doesn't matter if they have a fifth grade education, it doesn't matter if they have a criminal history, it doesn't matter if they have other issues, if they are considered a tribal elder in their tribe, and it, it, it's important. It is important. I jumped ahead a little bit, but again, these are just some, uh, some, some basic stats. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is, uh, what happens if you are cross-examining the witness who happens to be an elder and you believe that this witness to be you know, untruthful, you need to impeach this witness, and you don't want to offend your jury. Cross-examination comes in a lot of different styles. There's the scorched earth style, then there's the, the, then, then there's the way to, to gently pick them apart. 
And that's the one thing that you have to always do, especially with certain individuals. If it's a tribal elder, if it is a child, if it is, uh, you know, if, if, if it's an elder person, you don't want to be beating them up too much because it, it looks like it's too easy. But secondly, if you're dealing with a cultural issue in which you have a tribal elder sitting on the witness stand, you don't want to offend them. So what you want to do is you treat them with respect, but of course you gently uh, you slice them apart. And it's in your closing argument where you point out all the fallacies. And of course, you note your respect for that tribal elder, and despite that you still hold that respect for their title, but you have a concern that number one, there, you know, while you hate to believe that anybody would lie under oath and would be untruthful, this tribal elder clearly is mistaken. And I've often, I've often tried to be careful about calling any witness a liar. Because if I have one juror who likes this witness, if I call this witness a liar, a liar in my closing argument or at all, I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose that juror. That's all I care about. I want this juror to go my way. So instead of the word liar or a lie, it's a mistake. They forgot. It. They misunderstood. And that is a a better way to do it. Sort of like you know, my grandmother could call anybody, any name in the world, because all she had to do was start with, you know, bless their heart. And and that made everything after that okay. You know, so when my grandma said, bless her heart, they're so stupid. It didn't offend anybody. Same type, same type of thing here. The score stroke cross-examination uh, can be appropriate in certain circumstances. But I would say 90% of the time, the methodical, uh, you know, slice, slicing away at the testimony one piece at a time, and then explaining away as, you know, you don't want to hurt them too bad, but give them, you know, explain to them that they just couldn't help or they misunderstood, they didn't remember, because it's been a long time. Uh, as, with, as with any jury, you know, you're uh, trying a case in uh, Rogers County, uh, you know, whether you're in Benita uh, versus Oklahoma County, if you're trying a case uh, out in western Oklahoma, you know, if you're in Beaver County, it's a lot different. You have different social economic status. S same with dealing with Native Americans, especially ones who live and remain in tribal housing. They may, you know, the, the job opportunities may be less. Fewer job opportunities, less income. It doesn't mean that they're not qualified, it doesn't mean they're untruthful, it doesn't mean they're not a good witness or a good juror, but you have to take that consideration as you're presenting your case. If you have, if, 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 if your juror has an average income of $33,000 and you're bringing an expert witness who's being paid $2,000 an hour, every, and I've had one of those cases, I can, I can tell you right now, after that question, how much are you being paid? The jurors quit listening. They didn't care anything about what that expert said. So uh, keep that in consideration when you're when you have your jurors and who, who your witnesses are. Uh, health issues. This can come up, especially you know if there's uh, if there's medical issues in, in your case. You also have to take it into consideration. Uh, pay attention to your jurors. Sometimes the judge may not observe that a juror needs a break. They need to go to the restroom. They may, they may need to go to the restroom more often. They may need to go take their medicine. And these questions should be be, uh, be looked at when you're picking your jury. Can, can a juror who has a serious health condition, can they sit for three weeks? And are they going to disclose it to the judge? And that's when, that's when you need to call jurors up to the bench and have these type of discussions because they may not put this on their jury questionnaire. But these are things that you need to remember because these, uh, these are the type of the health issues that Native Americans seem to suffer from the most. Again, it's a generic statement. It's not applied to any specific uh, tribe. It's being very generic. Educational differences. Again, has nothing to do with being Indian. Has nothing to do with family. But sometimes it's just what people grow up with and what they're used to. I grew up in a very small town. And going to college was kind of a rare thing. Me going to college was almost by accident. I liked playing football. Someone said, hey, if you come play, play football a little bit more, we'll pay for your school. I really wasn't thinking about school. I was thinking about playing football. And kind of, kind of, kind of took, took things from there. Think your educational differences. 
you know, I remember in the 1970s, there were a lot of television commercials encouraging kids to finish high school. By the 80s and 90s, those commercials disappeared. Now it's more about getting to college, finishing college. And college is more, you know, obviously more opportunities, more aligned opportunities, but you have to remember the educational differences that you might have with a tribal jury versus a jury in Tulsa County or a federal jury. In uh, state juries in Oklahoma, where did the jurors come from? Driver's license. Driver's license. Federal court, where did the jurors come from? Voter's registration. You talk about two separate, two very different types of juries. Everybody wants to get a driver's license because everybody wants to drive. Not everybody goes to register to vote. So you get two very distinct type of juries. Federal juries, they're usually older. I, I, I once tried a case of 12 people in which every person on the jury, this was a federal court in Oklahoma City, every person on the jury happened to be retired from Tinker Air Force Base as, as a civilian retired. It was just a very odd coincidence, but that's how it shook out. But keep in mind uh, the educational differences. Choose your words. Don't use those, those highfalutin words, those $3 words. Let me check my time. Just make sure I don't talk too much. Uh, this, this deals with a, a, another, uh, another tribe. I was trying to find a similar with Oklahoma, but didn't have a good chart to put together. But just to get, kind of give you some idea how it can vary from tribe to tribe. Some tribes have much more educational opportunities than others. Tribes vary from size to size. Some tribes give per caps, some don't. Some invest their money in certain aspects, some don't. Some have, uh, are, are more wealthy due to their location for casinos. They have more investments. They do defense contracting. Every tribe is different. They have different experiences. This is a sad fact that you need to keep, keep in consideration, especially if you're dealing with, uh, with uh, witnesses who may have lost family members. Jurors may have lost family members to suicide. It's a very real fact. And you may want to keep this in consideration when you're trying a case, whether you're trying to seek money to make somebody whole again, or you're defending against it, or you're prosecuting, or you're defending, you're going to have jurors who may feel more sympathetic, who may be more forgiving, because they, they recognize how short life is, how precious life is. And should someone go to prison for 20 years rather than a year? because they did something stupid? Do they think that they can be rehabilitated? Are they going to be a more forgiving type of juror because they realize what it's like for someone to lose a child? They can look up there on that witness stand or look at that, that defendant and say, that's somebody's son. I, I, wouldn't want, I, wouldn't want to see, I wouldn't want to have another mother feel what I do about losing their son. Domestic violence. Uh, domestic violence is something that you have to remember. Uh, domestic violence is higher in Indian country. Um, you know, the two places it's the highest is both in the military and Indian country. I suspect, and, uh, and also with sexual assaults as well, it, it's, it is a fact. I suspect, though, that you know when, when these statistics do come out, they're not untrue. I just think that it's probably worse in other areas as well. They're just not running the statistical analysis there. They're not running you know, as much on college campuses or, or uh, they, uh, they, kind of, they kind of broke it down the military, college campuses, uh, tribal lands. You know, they haven't broken it down to sexual assaults in rural counties versus large counties, so on and so forth. I, I would imagine the numbers are going to be the same, but something you need to be, be aware of because if you have a witness who is a sexual assault victim, domestic assault victim. You have to be very careful. If you're interviewing them alone and they don't feel comfortable talking to you, and you can't understand why, and if you're a male and your witness is a female, and you don't know this about them, or you do know this about them, you need to know that the reason they feel uncomfortable is that they've had a bad experience with a man. You have to find a way to make that person comfortable as a witness with you as a person, as a, as a lawyer directing them through to provide this testimony. They have to feel comfortable with you. One of the things I always tell people when picking an attorney, I say, look, I want to give you five attorney's names. These three are absolutely the best attorneys, but the other two, I think you're going to like them better because that's the most important thing. You have to be comfortable with your attorney 
and you have to trust them. The first three might be brilliant, but you might end up hating them, and you may not trust them, and you may not get the results you want in your case because they're not going to be able to communicate or reach you the way that these other, these other attorneys can. Please keep in mind, I think I've already covered this. Reservation, tribal housing, educational opportunities. Is there internet access? There are still places where the internet is not accessible in, in certain tribal areas. Opportunities co mingle what I mean by that is do they see, do, 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 are they close to a large city? Uh, are, they, are they restricted to a reservation? If you've been on the, if you've been on the reservation with the Navajo, or if you've been up at Pine Ridge, you can be born, raised, and live your entire life on Pine Ridge and never leave the reservation and never know what it's like in the outside world unless, you, unless they're watching t television. I've, I've talked about uh, the, the economic aspect a little bit. It is something with uh, Native women. They have left fewer opportunities and they find themselves in poverty more as, as single mothers. It's something to keep, to, to keep in mind. Okay, like Carnegie Hall with witnesses. Practice, practice, practice. This isn't just meeting with a witness in your office. Every, every judge I've ever been in front of has always made it available to me to bring a witness into their courtroom just to prepare them. Whether it's a child, whether it's a someone who's elderly, whether it is a, you know, a client who's been abused and is afraid of the system. Let them get used to the courthouse, coming through the door, knowing where to go, where the elevator is. Where the witness room is, where they can almost kind of hide out a little bit, a safe place to go. The law library, the law library on the second floor of the Oklahoma County Courthouse in the back in the, in the corner, there's a place there you can go. In uh, the federal courthouse, second floor, there's a, there's a witness room there that you can go. And nobody, nobody will, uh, none of the other witnesses will know that you are there. You can go there. They need to know how to reach you. They also need to know what it's like to sit in the witness stand and practice. Practice looking at, at, at that courtroom. Get used to that room. You know, some of these courtrooms are, can be very intimidating. Let them spend some time there. In fact, I, uh, a case I tried, uh, I tried a while back had several children involved. And with these children, you know, I put them all on the stand. I brought people in the courtroom. I put a fake jury up, uh, just friends, just so they could get used to seeing people sitting there. We, we, you know, we, we played. We, we even, I even let some of the children pretend to be the lawyer to ask the questions, and with permission of the judge, I uh, let the kids sit up at the judge's bench and wrap the gavel. So they felt comfortable in that courtroom when they came back in. They remembered it was not a scary place. It was a place where they laughed a little bit, got to have a little bit of fun. These are things you have to do. Practice, practice, practice. Now, of course, the biggest challenge is time. Where do you find time to do all these things? you got to make it. you got to make it happen. Um, jury selection in the federal court, the judge usually does not allow the attorneys to do any personal or dire. Uh, you can submit questions to the judge, and the judge will usually ask those questions. Uh, state court, tribal court, really depends on the judge. You usually get to do a little bit more talking to the jury during your board dire. Uh, you know, I always like to uh, tell people, you know, board dire generally means speak the truth, but where I grew up, instead of board dire, we just call it jury pickets. Choice of words. Careful with your phrases. Know that you know, know, know what some of these words mean. I know that uh, when they, this is going to sound 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 very you know very very strange, but it happened. I was trying a case, and I had a case in which I was prosecuting a gentleman. He was a cotton textile salesman, and he testified. And this was the one exception where I, I broke the rule and calling somebody a liar. In my closing ar uh, argument, you know, because he was a cotton textile uh, salesman, I thought it would be, you know, if, and let me point out, everybody involved with this this trial was was white, and my defendant was white, and I referred to my jury or I referred to my defendant, my closing argument, as a cotton picking liar. I thought it was funny. The jury hung. And I ended up uh, getting to talk with one of the jurors, and she was offended that I said caught pig and liar because she felt it was a racist term. And it was just a phrase that I heard a million times, caught picking. Stay away from it. Another phrase, 
where they talk about, it's become more well known, where they talk about somebody that's got their pound of flesh out of them. Well, if you, if you know where that comes from, it comes from Shakespeare, and if you know uh, the Taming of the Shrew, and if you know the story of the Taming of the Shrew and what that refers to, you will find people who are Jewish do not like that term at all, that phrase at all. So when you use that term, you know, they got their pound of flesh, if you have a juror who, who, who is Jewish, they may find that offensive. They may not, but you need to be aware of this. What phrases might offend, uh, might, 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 might offend Native Americans? And what's off the res? You know, trail of tears. I've, I've actually heard this being used before, and I, my jaw got dropped when somebody was using it lightheartedly. Know your tribe. Know their history. Know what matters to them. If their tribe does not have clean drinking water, don't stumble into something and make, make a joke out of it and make a reference to something that's offensive to them. Again, know your audience for closing arguments. Kind of gave you the reference, you know, where you get to know your jurors. You find out that you find out you have a tribal member from one specific tribe. If you can make a reference to them that they that all of a sudden they recognize that you know their tribe, you know their history, and you just pay this respect in a slight phrase in your closing argument, you got that juror. The example I gave earlier was with the uh, with, with the, the guy who served the seventh infantry division. Above all, you have to be culturally aware. Now, I'm trying to hear that this, this applies across the board, whether it's Native American, whether you know, whether it's African American, whether it's uh, if it's you know poor white, you know poor white kid who grew up in a rural county, whether you're from Texas, whether you're from California, whether you're from Virginia, New York. There's a culture to each of them, and you have to understand what they are, their background. What, what, what experiences do they have? And how, above all, how, this is the lesson, how can you tap into that witness to get the best testimony out? How can you tap into that juror to get the verdict that you want? With that, um, if anyone has any questions, I'm available. I'll be here most of the day. Uh, Thank you for your time. Thank you for, for, for listening, and I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much.